We talk a lot about what to feed your pet, but how often have you thought about how to feed your pet? Today, we're talking with Carol Svea from Mind Pet Platter about the best way to feed your animal and why and how it makes a difference to their health and well being. In many ways, how you feed is just as important as what you feed. I have to say this topic is so in my wheelhouse. I had such a good time speaking with Carol and I hope you enjoy the interview as much as I did. We'll be discussing how your animal's mealware can positively or negatively impact their mood, their appetite, and their stress levels why science supports ditching the bowl and how it is good for your animal, and why supporting your pet's instinctual drive will make them thrive. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. I'm trying very hard to get more and more education out to people because that's, I, I personally feel like that's what... S- our society is lacking is just like you need to learn like stop reading headlines and and dive deeper <laughs> exactly exactly i hear you because there's so much false information going on out there and so I, i'm i'm finding that more and more people want to talk because i'm really into the science of things And so they're fascinated. It's like, yes, this is what we need more of. So we've gotten a good group of people together and we're forging the way. So we can talk about that later then. Absolutely. But Carol, I am just so thrilled to have you on. I know we chatted a little bit when we met. Um, This is so in my wheelhouse and something that I don't often get to bring to my viewers and listeners because... I'm just very, like, I'm very science focused in, in what I, I love. I just love the science behind things and especially the psychology behind things. Um, funny story, not funny, but funny, funny, (laughs) haha, but cute story. When I was, um, at ODU and I was, we, you know, we have a set number of psychology in, in undergrad, a set number of courses and to meet the you know minimum requirement you basically take every single course there is in psychology um at on campus and they did not they had retired the animal psychology program and i went to the dean and i said i'm not the only one we need to bring animal psychology back and he said okay if you can find a teacher who will do it we'll, we'll go for it. And I found a teacher that would do it and they brought it back. And I, I barely got in the class. It registered, like it was full within like 30 minutes of opening registration. (laughs) So it's not just me. Everybody is interested in this. Um, so, and this is what you do, right? You study animals and the psychology of animals. So how, tell me a little bit about yourself and what led you to decide to study wolves and big cats? Well, it's uh, an interesting story. Um, I originally got my PhD in psychology and sociology and was working with global food companies, um, National Institute of Health, uh, FDA, and trying to understand human feeding dynamics. And then we had a little puppy named Pip who, little 15-pound Havanese, who had um, a great appetite, and she used to scarf down her food, eating from a bowl, and let out the most horrendous belch that I couldn't have anybody (laughs) over because they'd have tears streaming down. It was like a 500-pound football player letting out a belch. 
So one day I was cutting up some chicken breasts for her on a cutting board. And my daughter said, don't throw the scraps and juices away, mom, give it to Pip. So I put the board down. And for the next 15 minutes, this dog was totally engaged, circling it, licking, just enjoying herself. And she picked her head up and licked her chops and said, thanks, mom. So I told my husband, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he was the designer behind the product. But um, I told him what happened. And he said, Eureka. And so we started talking through the dynamics of what happened. So I took all of my research experience, the tools that I knew about, and just dove in to the animal world. And I understood that, for example, dogs, their closest um, ancestor is the gray wolf. They share over 99% DNA. And of course, wild cats for our common ha uh, house cats, um, that really animals are instinctive creatures. All of their behaviors still operate. We see it day in and day out. So I thought, you know, we changed their feeding ecology. They were out in the wild. They had to kill prey. They had to deconstruct carcasses. And we forced them through evolution and the domestication of dogs. We forced them into a bowl. And when you think about it, most of the calls that vets get, it's related to eating, digestion issues, anxiety issues. So I said, let's go back and really understand feeding from a dog and cat's perspective. And so that's what led me there. And I volunteer at zoos and I reached out to animal experts, uh, preserves, you know, just building this knowledge. And I watched so many tapes of deconstructing carcasses. And uh, for many of your viewers, many of the zoos have uh, carcass feedings, which people can observe where a full carcass is, for example, put in um, with the African wild dog who closely resembles sort of the wolf. You can see their actual, how they deconstruct carcasses. And it just opens a whole entirely different view. These wolves and wild cats are programmed to survive in the wild and the instincts that they have, the feeding behaviors that they have. When you understand that, then you can understand how to feed them the way that they're meant to be fed, which is naturally. And that, that's kind of a quick summary. How's that, Jessica? <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating to me, and I do just want to say I'm I'm terribly sorry to hear that you lost your husband. Um, I'm oh, thank you. Sure, that was a a big big loss. Always a big big loss. Um, but it sounds well, like this he was is a, especially this is a legacy of love, um, and that's what makes the pet platter so special as well. Is each day that I carry on, he's with me. This is what we really committed our lives to doing. And um, he was a pet lover like you wouldn't believe. So it's it's a joy to be doing it. That's so wonderful. And I, um, I, I couldn't help but kind of giggle when you were talking about your tiny little Havanese having like this horrible like, belch, because I feel like especially <laughs> for, for people like me who are, we, we are, we, the term we call our, we're in the raw feeding community, like quote unquote, because right. we are very passionate about feeding our animals um, as close to a species appropriate diet as we can. And I think that's one of the things that like, it is a little odd about us is not only the like, we're so in tune with everything that comes out of our pets, whether that's, right. you know, a, a belch or gas or their stool. Like we are just so fascinated with all of it. <laughs> that's, that's great. I love that insight. <laughs> Because well, it and, tells and you so the, much about what's going on. Yeah. Right. 
Well, and this is why one of the reasons I'm working with more and more veterinarians and, um, you know, I've spoken with Dr. Judy and Julie at Adored Beast and all of these people and, you know, just being able to say the bowl is counterproductive. It, you know, it was for our convenience, not theirs. So what veterinarians are saying now is this is the species appropriate feeder. It's a species appropriate way to feed your pet. So I'm almost looking at it as a prescription for our dogs and cats because it does benefit their health. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious. So to me, <laughs> I'm very like, we need to be as species, as species appropriate as possible with our dogs and our cats. Um, but there are some people out there that just haven't quite grasp that, maybe don't understand. They're, they're very much into the convenience of, you know, everything available modern day. Why right. do you think it is so important that the animals that now live in our house, that we have our, our dogs for sure, we've, you know, domesticated our cats. I think there's, there's an argument to say that we're, we're currently domesticating cats. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you think it's so important that we um, we try to mimic those eating habits of their wild counterparts? Well, it's a great question. And um, I guess the best way to approach this is to actually talk about what a bowl does during the feeding process. And first of all, um, you're asking your dog or cat, to put their face into a hole, okay, which is dark, and um, it blocks their peripheral vision. And believe it or not, dogs and cats both have superior night vision as well as motion detection. So by having food bouncing around in the bowl, you're also increasing anxiety. But the other thing is the bowl is not designed to fit the nose of the dog, the snout. It's constantly banging up against. And if there's one thing I can convey to your viewers today, dogs and cats see the world through their noses. Uh, dogs have over 100 million sun sites, depending on the breed, going up to 600 million, compared to our 6 million. And cats have over 200 million sun sites. So this is their most powerful sense. And by having the food sit piled in a bowl, they can't engage their sense of smell. So it's like feeding them blindfolded. That would be an analogy for us. And then the other thing is when their peripheral vision is blocked and then, um, you know, they're, they're sort of struggling with the motion and everything going on in the bowl, their hearing is the most sec second most powerful sense, and they hear at much higher frequencies and hear decibels that we can't even hear. So when your dog is eating, and especially if you're feeding in a kitchen in a bowl, you have blocked off this wonderful sensory circuit they have to protect themselves and their food in the wild. So that actually heightens anxiety. And the one area you never want to serve your pet is in a corner because it's the most threatening situation for them to be in, which leads to food dumping, food relocation. And in my experience, the bulk of finicky eating comes from anxiety-ridden feeding situations. In fact, uh, I, I had um, one pet parent come up to me at the Raw Natural Summit uh, at, that dogs naturally used to have. And she said, I've been feeding my dog for over 10 years by hand. She will never, never eat out of any other feeding device. So we gave her a pet platter to try and said, take it for free. If it works, come back. And she came back the next day and she said, I can't believe it. My dog won't eat out of my hand anymore. <laughs> so the, the first most important thing is this whole notion. They are programmed for survival and for resource allocation. Let's honor that in a way that isn't contained in this small area. 
The other thing I'd like to say is when food is piled high, what we're basically doing is telling the dog, don't worry about exploring, sniffing, forage, licking, any of that. So they tend to gulp their food. But in a lot of the video analysis we've done, dogs learn how to get to food as fast as they can. They're masterful creatures at that. So what they learn to do is use their lower jaw to push the food up against the side of the bowl, which creates a backwards conveyor. So they're actually taking in more food and air, which coagulates going down because they do not have amylase in their saliva. So goes down, plops in the stomach, and that's why bowl feeding increases the likelihood of GDV and what is commonly referred to food bloat. And I don't know if people are necessarily aware of this, but food bloat isn't GDV, but it's when large volumes of food and air hit the stomach and it can imitate, imitate it and cause a lot of stomach distress. So piling food, it's, it's sort of like us eating from a fast food container. You never enjoy the food. You'll finish the whole box and still feel hungry. That's sort of what we're doing to our pet. And then the last thing is when it's sitting in a bowl, your dog and cat have no control over their feeding territory. And out of all of our uh, research, we find having that control is so important. I've actually observed uh, wolves in the wild who have small prey like a rabbit and they'll put it down. They're sort of looking around and another wolf can come in in a split second. It looks like a streak across the screen. You can't even see the wolf in, in form because they're so quick. So that's why it's important to have a broader area where the dog can circle and feel in control. It's just like when they go to sleep, they'll circle to make sure it's a safe area for them to be in. So everything they do is instinctive. Their drives are all designed to help them survive. Wow. There was so much in there and I thought of so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and I haven't I'm even gonna... talked about the pet platter yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, I actually, you know, I actually, my First thought, like as a, a progression of being a pet parent, basically, right. I started feeding my cats on flatter surfaces first because of whisker stress. That was like my big, you know, right. you always have the cats when they're, when they get dry food, especially like they're eating out of the center of the bowl. And it's like, you know, those memes go around because, you know, they're going to wake you up at 3 a.m. to feed them when there's food in the bowl, but it's not in the right. center because they can't see it and their whiskers are hitting the sides of the bowls and it's just really a lot of anxiety for them right um and then that kind of that my evolution went to i don't know if you've ever um heard of or met emma rutherford she's an animal yeah. diet formulator in the uk and uh -huh. she is very big on feeding off of flat what she she likes wood just because it's a more natural um, substance for her dogs. And, um, so I, I've transitioned to feeding my dog that way and only recently found the mind pet platter. Um, and the science behind the mind pet platter is just like, wow, this is amazing. It's like I was saying at the beginning, this is so in my wheelhouse. I love this. Um, but I did want to ask you a couple of things as a dog trainer. Um, I have unknowingly, always with my resource garters, when I'm, I'm going into a home where somebody is complaining of a resource garter, I always, first thing I'm doing is ditching the bowl and not quite knowing the, the science behind it other than th this is causing a lot of stress and anxiety, this bowl is. And so that's kind of been something I, I have, I've done over the years, but I am curious and I, and I want to ask you about this. I've always been a big fan of ditching the bowl with all dogs. I, I use right. their food in a lot of instances to train with. Um, and I'm wondering from your perspective, if that is adding anxiety unnecessarily in the dog's life, 
um, because I'm making them work for their food, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what? That's an interesting question. And, um, you know, BF Skitter with the whole positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement orientation. And in my experience, using it as a positive reinforcer develops a positive relationship with food versus a negative relationship with food, which in many instances with animals, negative reinforcement can lead you there. And I've even experienced this with certain types of feeders as well. So for example, slow feeders, which have projectiles projecting into your dog or cat's nose, the inside of their nasal cavity uh, is made of mucous membrane and it's very sensitive. And if your dog or cat are banging their nose against that, it causes swelling, which causes pain and discomfort. And then as they're trying to jab their nose and snout to get into the food, food can fly into the nasal cavity. And that actually dries out the mucous membrane. And that prohibits them from being able to smell. So mm -hmm. in many instances, that is sort of creating a negative relationship with food. It's, it's um, counterintuitive in terms of how they're supposed to be eating. And then the other one is in terms of um, lick type mats. Again, they're designed to prohibit. And so food gets caught in those corners. And what ends up happening is a highly repetitive licking which leads to obsessive compulsive licking. And not only does it create, create strain in the neck muscles, but it also can lead to negative behavior and a negative relationship with food. So I think that's why everything with the pet platter is the scoops, the ridges, everything about it is designed so the pet can get to it. He has to work mm -hmm. for it but he's being rewarded by getting the food as well. It's when they smell food and they can't get to it because of their um, uh, survival instinct, their, their feast or famine drive, they have to keep on working to get to that food. So anything you use, it should be something that your pet can actually obtain the food. If not, you're creating a frustrating feeding or snack experience for them. That is so interesting. I have used licky mats in the past, um, but I don't, I have never bought the like, the more difficult ones. They're always like the super easy ones. <laughs> and um, yeah. my husband has always been like, why are we do? why are you using, you know, it doesn't make sense to him. <laughs> and um, so we don't use them very often, but I've, yeah, I've always kind of, I've never recommended or tried a slow feeder, something in the back of my mind has always been like, I don't, something just doesn't quite feel right about this. Um, though I've never said anything negative about them. Yeah. <laughs> I've just never recommended yeah. them. So that's really yeah. interesting to me. I, I love the uh, insight that you have on that. Um, I, I did also want to ask you a little bit more about the platter because you did design it yeah. to help dogs and cats have a more realistic eating experience. Um, you've kind of alluded to that a little bit, but right. how, what, what is the, the focus behind the creation of the platter? Well, believe it or not, we were in development for almost five years. And um, I went and did the research with uh, wild animals and collecting observational data and talking to experts in the field. And I have to admit, I spend more time at the zoo than I do with people <laughs> and love every minute of it. There's always something to learn there. But um, so I basically picked out the instinctive feeding behaviors we wanted to replicate with our feeder then my late husband, who was the product designer, we, he went through about eh, seven, eight, maybe nine renditions because it had to be marketable. So we had some really interesting designs to say the least, but we tested it out just about on 500 cats and dogs. We wanted to make sure 
that what we brought to the marketplace was going to work. And I know this looks very simple, but believe me, <laughs> getting here was not an easy thing. So the whole purpose is we picked a shape that was large enough that the uh, dog and cat could feel control over, that their bodies could properly circle and reduce that anxiety of the fear of somebody coming in and taking it. Then we made the surface wide enough to spread the food all across. And that way, there's no way they can gulp up their food. There's no sides to push against it. And another thing that we learned in, in the feeding of it is when you look at a wolf eating off of a carcass, they eat over the carcass and it's a convex position. When animals eat from a bowl, their neck curves to scoop, which leads to a concave, which is why many people, especially if you serve kibble, you'll see your dog trying to push the kibble down their throat because they're taking in too much and the neck is curving in terms of scooping it up. So the natural position is to eat over. And then because the food is spread all over the platter, they're pulling up smaller pieces, but they're also exploring it at the same time. So they're making food choices, which... Um, help stimulate their minds, but it's, it's also a communication to the pet parent to say, these are the foods I really like, okay? They're going to go after what they need nutritionally and what they like, and, and they all have individual sort of tastes when you think about it. Then the scoops here resemble the ends of bones. It was designed to fit the shape of the tongue, and this promotes positive licking, and in contrast to the lick type devices that are out there, um, this releases positive endorphins because they can get to the food and feel success and be rewarded for that effort within each scoop. So it's one of the core differences between the pet platter and other feeders. Then this outer edge here sort of resembles the rib cage where food can be stuffed in there and animals can pull it out, sort of resembling the pulling off meat from, from a bone. But the other thing is you can freeze foods and liquids on the pet platter. So a lot of people take goat's milk or bone broth and freeze it on there for a special treat, which is great fun for them. And um, so it does resemble the carcass and it just taps into what they know how to do instinctively, but all the anxiety is reduced because they're in control. They can get to every particle of food on there and they can totally see around them. Their sensory circuit is saying, you don't have to worry, everything's fine. So you'll see dogs actually calm down, eat slower, and have a more satisfactory meal. That's really incredible. I'm I'm just so fascinated by it, and I'm so thankful, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> that you care to do something like this. <laughs> uh, thank because you. I don't know That's of so anyone, kind of you. I mean, I don't know of anyone who's who's thought of doing this before, and. I mean, obviously nothing on the market tells us that anybody has had this idea before. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, you know, it took a while because when we first came out, we thought everybody was just going to instantly understand it. And people were like, what is this? And so we had to kind of step back, regroup and get our educational package together. And then people were going, Oh, I get it now. So it, it took a while for us to get there, but it's been really rewarding because there, there are so many stories where, you know, cats stopped eating altogether and um, having such serious issues. And when the platter came in, their cats no longer suffered whisker fatigue because for some cats, the nerve endings at, at the ends of the whiskers, they're so deeply embedded. 
for some cats, it's so painful, it, they actually cry, which is why they stop eating altogether. So knowing we help them or help people, you know, avoid digestive issues and GDV, it's been a really, really rewarding experience because we're just basically what we did is let Mother Nature guide us to tell us how our pets should be eating. And we eliminated all the problems caused by bowl feeding. So we really have Mother Nature to thank. <laughs> well, of course, she is all knowing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One thing I have seen a lot of, um, and again, I'm sure it's part of your educational package, is a lot of people seem to think when they see the product that it's plastic. Um, and I know that it's not. So can you tell me what it is made out of and why we should not be feeding on plastics? Well, we our, our whole goal was to try to get as natural as possible, and that's why we use a plant base using cellulose fiber. And uh, like I said, this has been a long journey. We've been struggling to find appropriate material out there, and then we've evolved over the years as well. So... I think one of the biggest, most important things I could share with your viewers is one of the findings that I learned that was shocking was that the cancer rates of dogs and cats are doubling every year in this country. And I was shocked to find out about that. And I know it's not only what we feed, but how we feed as well. And so one of the things we promise to do and we do um, is to send our finished product to an independent lab to establish food safety. And that means nothing can leach from the pet platter, and it's also non-porous, so nothing can absorb. And um, I know there's lots of different variations of everything, but I think one thing we can do as manufacturers in the industry is to guarantee food safety for our pets. And um, we also, it's 100% USA. We manufacture in Wisconsin. They're my second family. They think I'm odd living in the city of Chicago. Okay. <laughs> They're telling me, move up here, move up here. <laughs> And um, they're all wonderful people, but we, we follow good manufacturing processes, which guarantees that everything that's done in the manufacturing of this is, is done in accordance with, with um, a regimen that is safe and the product is good. And it's the reason why the pet platter is more expensive, um, but we always committed to being USA and to establish the best possible product that we could. I appreciate that so much. And I know so many other people that do. I'm one of those people that, first of all, I spend way too much money on my pets, like way more than I spend on myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I also am very big into quality and things that are made in the in the US. Um, I'm, I'm, I will always choose a product that is made in the U.S. if I have that option, um, right. you know, with is it's unfortunate that there are some, there are just some items in the marketplace that just aren't made in the U.S. anymore. But when we have that option, it's another reason why I, I love, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Westpaw. They have beds yeah. and toys for dogs. And I've just been such a big proponent of them because it's all U.S. Um, yeah. So yeah, like, I, I just think that we can do so much better as consumers to right. not only support our local businesses, but just support our country <laughs> and the manufacturing yeah. <laughs> process in our country. Uh, we, we can do a lot better. <laughs> right. Well, and you know what? I, I will say this. Um, you know, I, I understand why people manufacture overseas. It's a lot cheaper. But for our production runs, I'm always going up there during the production runs. I want to make sure that, you know, everything is being done right. And we take very much of a team approach. And so I'd like to consider us more um, of a family that works together to make these 
because without them, I wouldn't be able to do it. And their love and concern for pets and, and the quality of the product is, is so profoundly meaningful to me as well. So I'm blessed with a great family that um, is doing this. I wouldn't have been able to do it without everybody. That's such a wonderful sentiment, too, because it's true. As long as you make it that way, it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, where can where can we get the Mind Pet Platter? Where where can we where can we buy this? Um, well, if you go to our website, mine m i n e pet platter dot com, um, we have a listing of stores, so you can see if there's a store uh, near your location. And if not, uh, we do sell it online as well. And so between those two options, you should be able to easily get it. That's awesome. And where can people find you to follow you? You have Facebook, Instagram, where you at? Yes, uh, you, you can go to our Instagram, which is, let me look at this. I always get these confused, is Mine Pet Platter. M-I-N-E-P-E-T-P-L-A-T-T-E-R, and also on Facebook, which is the original Mind Pet Platter. Is, is especially Sorry, if you ahead. have any, uh, yeah, no, if you have any stories, um, please let us know. We love hearing and communicating with pet parents all the time, and I have a great team of people who is here to answer any questions. And please feel free to contact us because we're linked throughout the pet community. If you have a question or if you have a feeding problem or whatever issue you may have, we, we're connected and we can send you to somebody who can help resolve your problem. So I like to consider us one big family where we're all joining forces to help each other. That is, that's so true. I, I've, I've said that so many times and we need to support each other. Um, especially in, in the community that we have for healthy pets, uh, especially right. we're just, you know, so often, especially on social media, people are just like attacking, attacking, attacking. And for those of us in the healthy pet space, I just, I feel yeah. like we have to be, we have to be working together and supporting each other and lifting each other up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To help well, it's, each other, especially when the trolls hit. <laughs> well, you know, and it's really interesting. Um, I'm working with Dr. Jeff Feynman right now. We started to talk about the happiness of our pets. And really, at the end of the day, when you consider everything you're doing, it's to, to bring joy to your pet. And so uh, the pet platter brings in the mine pet platter, it's their personal feeding territory. And by allowing them to eat the way they're meant to, it improves their health and digestion. So we're working on a happiness equation, looking at different factors that lead to a happy life, which is one that is healthy. And, you know, the wellness of the dog, both mentally and physical, physically, what are the key factors that do that? And um, I think that's what we're all about now. It's helping your pet live their absolute best life. Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know, Je uh, Dr. Jeff Feynman is with Holistic Actions. Um, right. And they have some really great content that they put out as well. Um, so I'm, I'm excited that you're collaborating with him because he really does have a way of putting out content that is just like, it's, it's just the, like the way he, he puts things, he's like, it's just this simple and we just want happy yeah. animals. And I love that about him. <laughs> no, um, it's so really, really great. You're, you're, you're collaborating with him. And, and, you know, he's brought me more into this notion too of, you know, our emotional stance when we're feeding our pets as well, that, it's just not feeding your pet. Your pet is engaging with you. It's a bonding time between the two of you. And um, it's it's an important time. So come to it not being anxiety, ridden, foraging, praying, deconstructing carcasses. And so by spending more time with them during the feeding process, you're actually helping them recapture who they really are. 
because it, Brian Bailey wrote a book about celebrating the wolf within your dog. And once you gain that understanding, and I encourage all of your viewers, take some time and watch your dog or cat eating. What are you observing? What is your dog or cat communicating to you? And then trying different foods. And what do they go to first? What do they really seem to be enjoying eating? Let your dog communicate to you. Let your cat communicate to you. Because it's a bonding process. The, the pet platter brings the pet parent and the dog together. And there's one more thing I wanted to sneak in if you have a minute. It's... It's interesting, you brought up food aggression between animals and um, the pet platter comes in three different colors, blue and yellow. Of course. And then red. And the reason we chose those specific colors is they, uh, dogs and cats have a different color spectrum than we do. They can see and differentiate between those colors. So... Uh, when you use the pet platter, if you have more than one animal, get different colors. The color you first serve your pet on is the color they'll adopt as their personal feeding territory. And they'll respect the color and the feeding territory of other animals. And I was doing an interview where somebody called in to say she has two pets and they're actually calmer during the feeding process. And so one of the things I'm going to be looking into is if they see their color platter receiving food and another platter, but their platter is getting food, does it reduce that anxiety? Like, I'm not going to be getting my food. I'm not going to be getting fed. So once they establish their colored feeding territory, it actually reduces food aggression and food stealing. And if you have a really serious case of it, start out separating them a bit more and then bringing them slowly together again. But we've had um, pet parents call in to say, I had to feed my dogs in separate rooms, closed doors, everything like that. The pet platter has actually worked to do it. So Again, it's understanding how how Mother Nature created your dog. How can we use that to give them an environment for feeding, which is more natural for them? So I'd love for you to try that in some of your cases then, Jessica. The yellow pet platter, and if they have a light color floor, they use the red or the teal color pet platter. What that does is to create a contrast, and so even though the dog may not be able to see the actual detail of the pet platter because they're very nearsighted anyway, um, the one thing it will provide is sort of a, a perimeter line, which makes it easier for them to identify where the food is because their sense of smell um, is amazing, but it's also coming from different directions, which can be overwhelming if there's not the visual support as well. So um, it's just something to think about. Again, what are the, the natural things you can do in your own feeding area to help your dog who's experiencing certain challenges? Yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm excited to try it with my dog, but she's, she's, perfect like she's she has no aggression or anything but um just to give her the experience <laughs> i'm excited for her but for my cat i'm i'm beyond well excited and there, to try there's it an interesting types of sensory um sites with within their nasal cavity but there are um scent elements uh and it's called a vr1 where it helps distinguish between smells and cats have 30 of those uh, dogs have nine and humans have two so in actuality the reason why your cat is doing a lot more sniffing is because they have that sensitivity and they're probably saying is there a better food out there because they're better at differentiating between different types so it just shows you you know Dogs, cats, they all have their uniqueness too. 
and we can kind of understand why they're doing what they're doing once we learn more about them. So Carol, thank you again so much for educating us on, because it's not, I, I talk a lot about what we feed our pets, but how we feed our pets matters just as much. So I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing and the incredible uh, time and energy and research that you have put into putting the best possible product you can out on the market for our pets. So thank you. Thank you. And for those of you listening, please make sure to reach out to Carol. Once you try the pet platter, go to mine, M-I-N-E, petplatter.com. You can see if, if it's available locally. If not, you can order from her. I have to tell you, it is an absolute joy to get up every morning knowing that you're making a difference in pets' lives and just the the wonderful people you come across because pet parents, by having a pet, you naturally have empathy. And everybody I get to talk to, and then Jessica, people like you who are also dedicating their lives to improving the quality of life of pets. Um, I feel very blessed. I enjoy my work so much. And um, I just love working in a community where we're all joining for, for something good with our pets. So thank you to you and everybody else out there. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos in my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.